Okay, here we are with our final lesson in this unit on momentum and energy. And what we're going to do today in lesson number eight is that we're going to pull the concepts that we've learned throughout this unit together. And we're going to investigate the conservation of momentum and the conservation of energy together as objects collide. Okay, we've seen some examples of some very simple collisions. We have solved those using the conservation of momentum. But we also have, in some cases, the conservation of energy that both needs to be considered and can be considered because we can use it as a tool. Let's talk in general about two types of collisions. A perfectly elastic collision would exist at one end of the spectrum, and a perfectly inelastic collision would exist at the other end of the spectrum. And so what we're talking about is that an elastic collision is one where the energy and the momentum are both conserved, okay? And we should be very specific. The total momentum before and after the collision will be the same, and the total kinetic energy before and after the collision will be the same. So that's an elastic collision. We can use the conservation of kinetic energy. An inelastic collision, in contrast, is one where kinetic energy is not conserved. So we've got the conservation of momentum, yes, that's fine, but not the conservation of energy. And so we can think about a whole bunch of different examples where this might occur. An elastic collision would be one where we have no loss of energy to the, to the, out, to the outside world. So very often, collisions between things like billiard balls, pool balls on a table, could be classified as elastic collisions because Pool balls are going to deform very, very slightly, hardly at all. Um, there may be a little bit of energy released to the sound that may, that's made. There might be a little bit of energy that's released in different ways. But in general, those collisions are going to be very close at conserving their kinetic energy. Inelastic collisions, things like car crashes... We see, we can, we can physically see where energy is going to be lost to that system, where kinetic energy specifically is going to be lost to that system. Where, say, two cars collide, we're going to have heat that's produced, we're going to have the bending and the shaping of metal that's produced, we're going to have lots of sound that's produced. And so that is an example of an inelastic collision. But this is an important distinction to make. Momentum, conservation applies to all collisions, but kinetic energy is only constant in elastic collisions, okay? We are going to investigate now where this occurs. And so here is an example where we're going to have to use both. A 300 gram toy train and a 600 gram toy train are involved in an elastic collision on a straight section of model railway track. The 300 gram train is traveling at 2 meters per second and it strikes the 600 gram train at rest. What's the velocity of both trains after the collision? And so we say, okay, well, we've got the 600 gram toy train at rest. It's just sitting there. We've got 300 gram toy train. It's coming in and then all of a sudden, bang, there's a collision. This doesn't seem that difficult, but as you'll notice, it gets very complex. So we're going to divide this into two little sections. We're going to divide our page into two little sections. And we'll start first with the conservation of momentum. And so what we know is that if momentum initial is equal to momentum final, we've got m1 v1, and this is all in the i-hat direction, but we've got m1 v1 initially plus m2 v2 initially. So the mass of the first train times the velocity of the first train plus the mass of the second train times the velocity of the second train all initially. And then afterwards, we got M2V2 final plus M1V1 final. So far, this looks very familiar because we've done stuff like this before. And so what we have here when we sub in some numbers, very quickly we say, oh, we have a system where we have one equation, but we have two unknowns because we don't know the velocity of either of these trains after the collision. And this is where things are a little bit different than what we had before. 
When we were using just the conservation of momentum, I would have told you one of these final velocities, and then we would have had one equation and one unknown. But in order to solve this more generally, we don't have that at our disposal. So now what we have is we need to look somewhere else because we have one equation, two unknowns, we can't solve this. And of course, where do we look? Well, we're going to look at the conservation of energy. So we've simplified this equation. Here it is. It's in a nice little form. And we are going to make a substitution eventually. But now what we'll do is we'll say, okay, the kinetic energy initially is equal to the kinetic energy finally. And the reason that we can say this is because of one word, and it's right here. These two toys undergo an elastic collision. If this had said inelastic, we would not have been able to write this line, and basically we would have been stuck before we even got started. But because this is an elastic collision, we can write that the kinetic energies are conserved. So here is the conservation of kinetic energy. 1 half m1 v1 initial squared plus 1 half m2 v2 initial squared equals 1 half m1 v1 final squared plus 1 half m2 v2 final squared. Let's sub in our numbers. And here they are. And what you'll notice is we arrive at a second equation with the same variables. Now to put this in place, what we're going to do is we're going to substitute equation number one, the, this expression for v2 final, into equation number two. Okay, And so here it is, we've just substituted this value of v2 final, which is right here, we've substituted into this variable. Now keep in mind this is a binomial here, and so this right now needs to be expanded. And so this is going to be a little bit of algebra and a little bit of legwork for us. So we expand this out, we collect like terms, and what we end up with is a quadratic for v1 final. And of course, if we have a quadratic expression in standard form, we can use the quadratic formula, and we'll solve this, and we'll say, okay, there's going to be two roots, and now we need to make a decision about which root we take. So we've got V1 final equals 2 meters per second, or we've got V1 final equals negative 0.67 meters per second. Why is the first one inadmissible? Because this one is our positive root, and this one is our negative root. Why is this one inadmissible? Well, if we consider the initial velocity of V1, of object 1, which is a 300 gram train, it was 2 meters per second. So this root is popping out and is telling us that, oh, the final velocity of the train is exactly the same as the initial velocity of the train, and we know that can't be true, because conservation of momentum and conservation of energy have both occurred. So this cannot happen. This is an unrealistic root, and this right here, V1 equals negative 0.67 meters per second, is our acceptable answer. To find out what V2 final is, we now simply back substitute into equation number one, and we find that V2 final is 1.3 meters per second. Okay, so this is some legwork, but it's a pretty straightforward little problem. Let's take a look and see how we might handle a different type of elastic collision. Here, we've got two metal spheres, and they're suspended by vertical cords. And initially, at the beginning, they're just touching. Sphere 1 has a mass of 30 grams, and it's pulled to the left and raised to a height of 8 centimeters and then released. And it undergoes an elastic collision with sphere 2, whose mass is 75 grams. Find the velocity of sphere 1 just after the collision and find the height achieved by sphere 2 when it, reach, when it reaches its maximum. So we know m1, we know m2, we know the initial height, and that's it. That's all we know. So this problem, what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to basically divide this into steps. So let's find the initial speed of the first sphere of m1 right before the collision happens. So we're going to raise it up 
and we're going to drop it. And then just the instant before the collision, let's find out what that speed is. Well, here we'll look at the conservation of energy because we've got some gravitational potential energy of this pendulum, mgh, and that's going to turn completely into kinetic energy, one-half mv squared, because it's going to fall from its height of 8 centimeters down back to its equilibrium position. And so we've got, of course, our masses will cancel out, which is nice in this example, because I've got a common factor of mass on this side and on this side. Bing, bing, we can cancel those out. And I get that V1 is equal to 1.25 meters per second. So now, let's consider the collision. We know that momentum is going to be conserved. Momentum initial is equal to momentum final. And we can take a very similar approach to what we did in the last example. M1 V1 initial plus M2 V2 initial equals M1 V1 final plus M2 V2 final. And we can substitute in, and what we'll find is, of course, one equation, but two unknowns. And we can now say, all right, let's look for another equation to help us solve this. Of course, the place where we're going to find that other equation is energy, the conservation of energy. So we've got the kinetic energy initial is equal to the kinetic energy final, one-half m1 v1 initial squared plus one-half m2 v2 initial squared it equals the final kinetic energy of the system you can see here. We'll make our substitutions and we find example number two. At this point, we have two equations, we have two unknowns, we can substitute equation one into equation two, we can solve it, simplify it, and find the quadratic. After we've collected the like terms, we can now use the quadratic formula to arrive at our acceptable root which is that V1 final equals negative 0.54 meters per second. Now, if you want to try this for yourself, you can. I haven't shown that calculation here, but you can solve this for yourself using the quadratic if you'd like. You just have to press pause. Okay, and so now what we do is we back substitute into our first equation. 0.5 minus 0.4 V1 final. And we find out that V2 final is equal to 0.714 meters per second. Okay, so we've just solved for our velocity of um, the first right after the collision, V1 final, negative 0.54 meters per second. And we solve for our velocity of V2 after the collision. But the problem, the, the, the initial um, question asked us not to find V2 final, but to ask us to find the height at which the second ball will rise. So we need to do one more conservation of energy problem, which is to say that the kinetic energy that this one has, the second mass here, has a kinetic energy, and it's going to be transferred into potential energy at its maximum height. So we can rearrange, we can sub in our numbers, and we can say 3.6 meters per second. You should check this because I'm realizing that there's no squared here. And so you should check this answer. This is one half um, V2 final squared divided by 9.8. You should check this answer. I'm just noticing that this wasn't copied down. So check this and see if this works. All right, here's example number three. And this is a classic physics example. It's called the ballistic pendulum. And here in the ballistic pendulum, basically, this used to be measured. This is a device that used to be measured, um, used to be used to measure the speed of bullets before we had, like, radar, before we had electronic timing devices. Okay? So the version to the right, this is basically a, a large wooden block right here. Okay? It's got a mass of 5.4 kilograms. And it hangs down from these two long cords. A bullet, which has a mass of 9.5 grams, is fired into the block, comes quickly to rest, and then the block and the bullet swing upwards, rising a distance of 6.3 centimeters before coming to rest momentarily. 
We need to find the speed of this bullet prior to the collision. We know that this height is given. But this is an inelastic collision. And we know it's inelastic because when this bullet and this block collide, are we going to lose energy to the system? Absolutely. We're going to lose a whole bunch of energy due to heat, due to the deformation of the bullet, due to the deformation of the wood. This is an inelastic collision. So we're going to know that during this, during this collision here, we can't use the conservation of energy. But watch what we can do because we can still solve this problem. So the first things first, we know the, the masses of the system and we know the final height. That's it. That's all we know. We also know that the initial velocity of the block is zero and that the final velocity of the block is zero. But here is, a, this is a pretty classic example. So the momentum is going to be conserved. So the momentum before the collision is going to equal the momentum after the collision. So we've got one, we've got M1 V1 initial, so that's the bullet plus M2 V2 initial, that's the block, and that's equal to M1 plus M2 times the final velocity of both. Now, the reason that we're adding these masses is because after the collision, the bullet is actually embedded inside of the block of wood, so the mass would then add, and they would have one velocity together. We can simplify this by saying, okay, 0 0.0095 times V1 initial, so this is the velocity of the bullet, this is ultimately what we're looking to find, is equal to 5.4095 times the final velocity of this. The question becomes, okay, if, if this is my unknown, how am I going to find the, the final velocity of this block and, uh, and bullet together? How am I going to find that? Because it needs to come from somewhere. Well, we can't use the conservation of kinetic energy because this is an elastic collision. However, we can still use the conservation of energy after the collision. We can't use it across the collision. We couldn't say that the mass of the bullet times the velocity of the bullet all squared divided by 2 is equal to the kinetic energy after the system. We cannot say that. But we could say, hey, okay, well after the collisions happened, now we could use the conservation of energy and watch what we're going to do. Here we have initial energy equals final energy, but we're considering everything that happens after the collision. So we've got one half m1 plus m2 v final squared. So this is the speed of the block and the bullet after the collision. And what happens to the block and the bullet is that they rise to a final height of h. Of course, m1 plus m2 cancel out. We know g, we know h, and so we can find v final. It's 1.11 meters per second. At this point, we can now use this in equation number one to determine that v1 initial was 632.7 meters per second. And that's how we're going to solve these problems in general. Um, there's lots more examples to come and we're going to take our time looking through these. But this is, in general, kind of how we're going to approach these collision problems.